So um, we have a few minutes, and I understand that we're between yourselves and cocktails, but please have a seat. A couple of questions that came out of that. Um, Alan, thank you for sitting here with me for the duration of all these presentations. Right? Great. Um, and I want to kind of come back to you and Nikki for a moment. Uh, you mentioned context mm -hmm. as being one of the critical factors for uh, determining which ads go where. And Nikki, you were talking also um, about channels as context in this multi-channel, variate storytelling adventure um, that we're on. So what is the difference in this over-the-top world between our, is, is each channel context? It does context begin with a channel? Can you help me and maybe everyone else sort of understand? And then I'd, I'd actually like to hear from the guys at the end too, because I know they have a point of view. But So I would say that there's a couple of, if you consider channel, channel becomes a, a kind of a, a nebulous con concept when we start talking about cross-stream, right? Because is the app on your TV a channel? Is, the, is it channel two? Is that the channel? Um, but let's just say, for example, it's a, it's a group of programming that typically comes together um, in, in one, one place. We have in uh, many instances where you find that a channel itself will index to a certain uh, demographic, uh, a certain household income, et cetera. Um, but then there's also channels where the, the shows fluctuate um, very, very wildly so that you may end up attracting completely different audiences from show to show, right? So if you're going from a major sporting event mm -hmm. um, to a game show to a news program, you may see the demographics shift quite, quite significantly. So in that instance, it's about um, the context in, in my mind is really kind of comes down to the, to the show level, but the channel, channel does certainly matter. But, but the more granular that you can get, um, and you may see a different demographic uh, across different times and different devices as well, too. So for the same news program, the consumer on a mobile device may be completely different than a connected TV than as on traditional linear broadcasting. And, and you're, you're essentially doing audience-based buying in this journey. So um, back to the channel basis and what he just said, does that match up with how you want to find audiences? Yeah, I mean, we, we would look at it more from a point of view of the power of the media brands because, you know, even in that app ecosystem world, you would gravitate to the brand that is most relevant for you. So if I opened up my app ecosystem, I'd be one minute probably in E! News, one minute in Bloomberg, one minute in Vogue, and, and that, <laughs> strange but true, um, and, and that is what that's what we're seeing more of, that you will literally have a collection of brands that you, media brands, that you will access and consume for different reasons at different times of, of the day in different, in different places. I know when I'm in a plane, my media brand consumption is different to when I'm in bed, to when I'm in the kitchen, to you know, when I'm in the car. So I, I think that, yes, it puts greater onus, I think, and, and focus on media to build stronger brands because, you know, even when I'm a, I'm a very heavy consumer of CNN, Bloomberg, and CNBC, and sometimes, dare I say it, I forget which one I'm watching, um, and, and, you know, therein lies the blur. So I think, I think that uh, media brands will do a lot more work in terms of building uh, a differentiated position, especially as the Snapchats, Facebooks, in Instagrams, et al, are, are more accessible across screens, um, the onus will be on building much, much more powerful brands. And we've seen how it's failed in the publishing world, so take note. So the challenger brands, the over-the-top and connected challenger brands, some of whom are here as content providers, their goal is to become part of, I mean, the well-worn um, sort of concept around consumer marketing of consumers having their portfolio of brands that they adopt because it reflects their own ambitions and goals and um, things. I'd like to know from Paul, are you seeing that in terms of the behaviors of the viewers on the Cablevision network, that there is a core number of networks like Nikki, who apparently is changing channels every 60 seconds, so I wouldn't want to be watching with her, uh, um, but, uh, but it might be interesting, to say, right? Um, but are you seeing that? Is, that? is that typical? Because one of the challenges for advertisers is heavy TV viewers, you end up buying a schedule based on a ranker, and you end up over-indexing to those quintiles of heavy TV viewers. Is that the consumer behavior that 
that she just described, and is it changing? Well, <clears throat> when we talk audience-based selling or buying, we, we really mean audience-based. And audience have multiple dimensions. And one dimension is demographics. Another dimension is viewership, behavior. Uh, not everybody that falls within a segment demographically mm -hmm. views content the same way. And that's why we're passionate about census level data and, <clears throat> and measuring as much uh, viewership as possible. Because we do see a lot of differences between heavy viewers, light viewers, intermittent viewers, viewers who are heavy viewers live, but they're light viewers DVR, or heavy viewers DVR, they're light viewers live. And there's a big, big difference. And we're trying to develop the art and the science and how do we guide our clients to tell the difference. And we really need census level data in order to do that because a sample-based measurement mm -hmm. can't attract, can't, can't find these outliers and these nuances. You need every single data bit so you can look at the centrality of the data and say, well, for this type of segments, we need to look at it from a median viewership versus an average viewership. Okay. So, and, and yeah, so we absolutely see big differences and we're working with our partners to, to identify these differences. So, and Alan, based on what you had to say and, and the work you're doing with Clipped, who were terrific from a supply side um, perspective in TiVo, how are you contributing to what Nikki needs in, term, in terms of understanding that attribution also? Because there was, there was quite a lot of closed loop attribution being discussed and I'm, I'm curious how the new, uh, how SpotX is contributing to helping her customers understand the, the return on uh, dollar spent. Actually, I think um, Nikki's patterns uh, kind, of, kind of highlight exactly what I'm, what I'm speaking about in terms of the idea that, that connecting those dots on the data pieces, you have to follow the user as the user moves throughout the ecosystem and not just on one platform, but on multiple platforms. Our goal is working with um, you know, content owners uh, the, and the actual publishers of the content themselves um, to kind of create an open platform so that we prevent uh, the idea of the walled gardens uh, of data and mm. so that what we can do is enable both the publishers and the buy side to bring in their own data segmentation and then both forecast the audiences off that but also make the deals and transact that deals based on that, that data. So okay. do we assign a different price point for a certain demographic uh, and then we follow that demographic across devices and what, what kind of attribution do we do, we do uh, to do that? So that's bringing in uh, first party, third party data segments uh, DMPs, et cetera, and then aligning that and then uh, being able to match that up in real time um, at the time of the campaign, but also uh, being able to report on that after the fact and saying this is kind of what you hit. And, and giving the advertisers uh, the control through their chosen platforms to uh, opt in or opt out uh, to that particular ad opportunity based on their own on data cap. They may have uh, for example, seen uh, a, an impression occur uh, or a video ad being played on another platform so that the, as they're talking about their frequency capping and their, their journey and their storytelling, um, they're looking at that and, and rolling that all together on, on their backside. Th there's still a challenge for the, the ecosystem, but I think uh, the biggest issue is, you know, those people who are playing in the wall gardens, uh, eventually, you know, how do they get their data in and out of that and how do they, how do they close that loop? So back to something you said, John, which is that there's concern at the highest levels of um, the industry that the format, maybe the 30-second format, and, um, may not have the efficacy that it used to. Um, and maybe you and Nikki can sort of discuss this, this with, with all the automation um, that's happening and with some of the work that um, you know, is being done at Cable Vision around it. Is the 30 seconds of messaging um, is that going to be how we're still sort of exposed to brand messages in the future? Or are you finding that from an efficacy perspective, it's declining? I'd love to hear you two guys. Sort of, you know. Well, I think firstly, we, it's something that we as an MVPD don't see ourselves as solving directly. So our role in this is really to position ourselves as an enabler and a partner to the industry with the data and the capability of delivering all these things. So we, you know, the, the ad industry is going to evolve. And whether we do it or someone else does it, 
uh, these formats are going to be explored, and there's going to be new formats, uh, particularly in the VOD environment. So I think that's the first thing I'd say is that we, we sort of you know, position ourselves alongside a lot of this evolution. But at the same time, because we do have that consumer relationship and we are developing the video products, then we see our role is to sit with the agencies and the content providers, which is why I find something really funny is that we've got two sessions running at the same time, <laughs> ad tech and content, and who actually should really be in this room because you can't separate the two. You know, as, as we package content into products, into, into like, you know, VOD, mm -hmm. it's, it's directly uh, interlinked to how we run advertising, you know, how we reach consumers and that kind of thing. Excellent. Um, with the time we have, I'm going to see if there are questions from the audience, and if not, we'll get to continue to prattle on on this one. I see one over there. Hi there. Um, Lee Suka from Hitachi Consulting. Um, I think there's a quote from the film The Martian. And excuse my French. It says, we're going to science the shit out of this. <laughs> I, I, I see a risk you. that... Um, you know, with all the data science approach to targeting and audience management, there's, the, the two risks are, one, the audience feels like they're herded and they start to switch off. We're seeing that in the display world now. The second risk is that, and it's particularly to Europe, you know, data is much more fragmented. Its provenance isn't as strong. You know, are these issues that can be addressed? I just wondered if you had a comment on that. Uh, so I, I can speak to that a little bit. I mean, I think in, so, so kind of going through um, the idea that, that data is probably a lot more fragmented across Europe is, is totally the case. Um, that being said, I think that there are probably methods that respect the, the kind of different privacy laws of all the different countries. You know, obviously, you know, Germany is, is much tighter in terms of data law than uh, the UK is in terms of what they're doing. And each country kind of has their, their own, own thing. And we've seen some companies come in uh, from Silicon Valley specifically that have come in and kind of stepped all over those laws. Um, <laughs> For sure. So I think the the idea that that can kind of lead to a creepy factor uh, definitely is the case. Uh, I think, though, there are some people that are pretty well positioned to solve those those data uh, issues and, and unify that across across the board. You're seeing things like um, the actual ISPs and telcos step in uh, to offer their own data segmentation themselves. So they have you know big footprints where they they can go in and then you can onboard that data and utilize it. Um, as third-party data, but then there's also all the first-party data that people people bring in. I mean, if you think about the amount of data that retailers or automotive dealers are, uh, or automotive brands are sitting upon, um, that data is deterministic and spans spans out. Um, certainly, yeah, there there can be that can lead to instances where things get a little little creepy sometimes if it's done wrong. But I think if you if you apply, uh, it's been said several times, the art and science, if you're, you're applying that storytelling and, and that common sense, but you're using the data to make it more effective and you're, you're kind of supercharging, turbocharging that data, that, that, uh, that implementation, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in Europe to, to continue to drive this forward. So can I just say, you science the shit out of that answer. <laughs> Love that book, by the way. <laughs> that, that was, that was fantastic. But I, we're sort of back to the emotional versus rational that Nikki brought up. And you were talking about, too, next to... Yeah, I think the first part of the question is interesting but I think that's where, why it's such an opportunity and why it works, is that we don't have the luxury of experimentation that happens in the digital environment. So in, in with premium vi video and linear television, we can't afford to do something that makes people feel like they're being herded or tracked or any of those things. So if you look at some of the things that are happening in the US, they're very benign, uh, and particularly with the use of data. Um, I think someone made the point you know, uh, that our data, the, the set-top box data, is not going to solve world hunger and end all wars. There are a number of data sets that have to come together uh, to provide a, a seamless and um, uh, you know, high-quality linear video experience. And I think if you look at the things that happen, the way it's employed in the United States, uh, that hasn't been the feedback. It's actually been done uh, very effectively to a point where people don't even know that its targeted advertising is running. I think, yeah, there are sort of two things, and we were discussing this yesterday, that it's almost 
to get to get proper leverage usage monetization etc out of data you know it really is almost as, probably more complex than turning you know grapes into wine and that process um, needs a lot of a lot of work because data in its purest form I mean you can have a fantastic plethora of bunch of grapes but actually what, what are you going to do with them and, and you know we're finding that a lot of people are talking about data monetization but not necessarily understanding the process of actually making that data very very valuable turning it you know, into an algorithm that really gives you a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So, so you're, so a, vin you're a vintner. Yeah. <laughs> you're a winemaker. It's a new business. <laughs> well, so, uh, you know. please. No, I actually, look, we've done this. We've been through all these discussions. That's why in my closing statement, I invited the collaboration of multiple players to do this specifically in Europe because there are stringent laws. We comply with stringent laws in the US, and I can only imagine how, how more difficult they are across the U European uh, uh, area. But um, if, if you collaborate, you basically highlight the need of different parties, then there are standards that have to be respected, edit rules. I mean, we, we comply with privacy rules and regulations all the time. Certain size segments, we're not allowed to touch. So we, we set the expectations with clients. But it became more of a science where when clients call us to, to run analytics, they know what's acceptable to ask for, what's not acceptable. You can't narrow down the segment to a level where it becomes uh, too clear, so you make it ambiguous. But, but we comply with all this. Plus, there are auditing firms who will apply the rules and, and then the laws and the regulations on, during their auditing process. So that's why it's, it's a collaboration that has to happen. It cannot be done in silo, because if one group does it in silo, they could make mistakes. And that's where they that's, could damage the rest of the industry. That's, yeah. that, that's an excellent close. I want to thank the panel, not only for the, the tremendous amount of information um, and insight, but for the um, agricultural metaphors from Farmer Bob <laughs> to the point. vineyard. This is <laughs> something we're going to be taking away. I urge everybody to please come to the Connected TV Awards downstairs on the first floor and the upstairs in the Battle Bridge room because the ground floor is upstairs, right, Graham? Thank you. I want to thank everybody for coming, um, and I want to thank the panel again. This was terrific. Thank you, thank guys. You.